That actually leads me to uh, challenges because uh, I would like to know if the infrastructure is there for people who want to switch to HVO. Uh, do we have enough of uh, stations <laughs> with HVO or is it easy? Um, if I travel, for example, from Lithuania to Germany, will I find stations on the way? Yeah, so we have around 700 stations uh, together with our partners that sell our fuel and we also go to customers' uh, sites and fill up their tanks locally. Uh, so availability is increasing, but uh, of course more, more can be done. If you're in, uh, in Sweden, Finland, Denmark, uh, any of the Baltic states, uh, Netherlands, uh, Belgium, I would say the coverage is, is really good. Uh, we're just starting to grow now in, in Germany and France. And in the US, uh, we're strong on the west coast and starting to grow in more areas there also. So, uh, yes, uh, it is available, but it's also increasing all the time, the availability. And when it comes to your competitors who are providing uh, similar kind of products, uh, how does it work? Like, do you cooperate uh, in kind of like promoting uh, these solutions or do you just go your separate ways? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, good good question. We, I mean, we have been alone on the market for almost 15 years since we were a forerunner in this area. Mm. Uh, but now we're seeing uh, more and more competition, which is good because it helps to increase availability. Uh, and it also helps to spread the word about the product to increase knowledge because uh, frankly most people have no clue still what uh, HVO or renewable diesel is so it helps to spread the word. Uh, so that's good. We're also part of the uh, same uh, like interest organization uh, for lobbying um, for new legislations and things like that. Uh, but of course we are competitors, so we are competing for market shares and so on. Yeah. Uh, so depending on the topic, but I would say mainly competitors, but we're also helping to, to spread the word to, together. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. So as far as I know, um, the combustion engine maybe is to be banned. And in 2035, uh, there might not be any sale of uh, vehicles that emit um, greenhouse gas emissions. So no combustion engine, right? Uh, if that actually happens, how, do, how will that affect Neste and your competitors? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting area. And f first of all, we, we are a bit worried about this legislation because we think it's uh, also a bit of a misunderstanding because the problem is not the combustion engine. The problem is the fossil fuels. So uh, it would be better to ban fossil fuels than a combustion engine, because a combustion engine can be run on uh, HVO, on e-fuels, on hydrogen and so on. Uh, and it's just, you could compare it also to a battery electric vehicle. A battery electric vehicle can be good or bad, depending on if you, if you run it on coal power electricity, it's not so good. But if you run it on green electricity, it's really good. So I think, the key thing is to focus on the energy source, not, not, the, not the technology itself. So, so we are actually looking for more technology neutral legislation and promoting that. Uh, but of course, if we come to this uh, legislation that's uh, basically that is, is decided right now and nothing changes, uh, it will affect us. But uh, there's a big fleet already out there. So if we look on trucks, for example, uh, the target from many OEMs to sell 50% uh, electric truck by, uh, by 2030. Uh, but still, that would mean that 90% of the trucks on the road would be still diesel or diesel hybrids. Uh, so the, the fleet renewal takes so long time and we will see these older vehicles on the road for such a long time. Probably decades. So, yes, <laughs> so there's still room for, and need for renewable fuels to help meet the climate targets. But uh, for us as a fuel producer, uh, it's nice to also be part of the future and that's why we're looking to see changes or updates in these legislations also because if you're to invest in new refineries and, and so on, it's nice to see that there's a future market also ahead when making these big investments. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the obstacles that Neste had to overcome recently that you can share? 
Yeah, I think it's been it's been a journey for us. Uh, so we, we transitioned from being a, a small local uh, oil company in, in Finland to being a, a world leader in renewable and circular solution and being a global player Quite in this journey. area. Yeah, so <laughs> it's been many steps across across this way uh, and very interesting uh, journey to be on. Uh, but of course it comes with uh, challenges and so on and being a forerunner is always, uh, it, I mean it comes with some benefits, you're first in the market but it also comes with some drawbacks that you have to convince people that it's, uh, it's a safe and good product to use uh, and so on. You have to be a pioneer in many yes, yeah, aspects. Yes, really, but it also has led to, I mean, attractive many many good colleagues and people wanting to work in a company that is on this pathway and is really driving the shift to sustainability. So it has also, I think, helped us to create the atmosphere in the company with really people that want to make this shift and our, our target for the, or the motto of the company is to really to create a healthier planet for our children. And uh, it, it's really something we live by. Uh, but is there any support from governments or the European Union uh, to support the development of the renewable fuels? Yeah, th there are some uh, good uh, legislation in place that promotes renewable fuels, but I think uh, more can be done than we have seen in local countries where they have selected to uh, increase blending mandates and things like that. It really helps the market development. So. Uh, there are some legislation in place, but much more could be done. And it's often about closing the, the price gap to, to fossil diesel, because uh, typically these type of products are more expensive to produce. Uh, and any in incentives uh, to help the customer make the right choice uh, is, is of course of beneficial to, to increase the usage. But um, why do you think companies or um, even individuals should switch to uh, renewable energy? Like if you had to explain to someone why should they switch from fossil fuel to, uh, for example, HVO, what would be the main reason or a few reasons? Yeah, I, f I think the main reason is to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, I mean, up to 90% greenhouse gas re reduction, that's really competitive. It's hard to find other solutions that give you that much uh, reduction. So it's really from a, a climate standpoint. Um, and also, of course, it's, it's a high quality product. So it's also nice to your engine. Uh, but I would say the main, main uh, driver is, is uh, to reduce uh, emissions, basically. Because you mentioned that it's a little bit more expensive, so that's why yeah. I wanted to know, like, why should people consider paying more yeah. um, for, for, for this? Yeah, and, and w when you start looking into it, typically uh, what, what companies do uh, is they look at the total cost of ownership model, what is the cost, and if, if you want to lower your emissions, you start comparing different options. And then, of course, uh, this option where you can stay with your existing fleet and in infrastructure and the own cost is not that high. Uh, so it re it's really an at attractive offer and also a, like a very easy and quick way mm -hmm. to, to start uh, reducing your emissions. So. Because it's not like you need to buy um, additional equipment for that or another type of vehicle, right? Yeah. Um, but when it comes to uh, Nesta, what do partnerships or collaborations with the clients or um, suppliers? Like what role does it play? For yeah, I, th I think partnerships are the key thing. We can't do this alone. We really need to work together and also create uh, together circular solutions. So we had a we have a nice example now with uh, Hesburger, uh, where we collect used cooking oil from their restaurants here in, in, in the Baltics and in Finland. Uh, and we then produce fuel out of it. Uh, and those restaurants produce it's quite big volumes of uh, used cooking oil. So it's, it's really a nice collaboration. And then they use our product for some of their logistics uh, to make the de deliveries of the food back to the restaurants. Uh, so that's, I think, a nice circular yeah, uh, solution. Say, yeah, sounds like a circular economy, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Presentation. <laughs> and it helps to create the understanding also. But then also we have partnerships with, uh, for example, Royce Royce MTU uh, for the large diesel engines, uh, where we work together. Uh, to spread the word, uh, word and uh, help expand the knowledge. 
Uh, we also have companies like uh, Volvo Group, uh, which uh, pre-fills their vehicles in most of their plants with our fuel. So when the vehicle is delivered, it already has a certain amount of uh, our fuel in it. And that also helps to create uh, a security feeling for the customer. Okay, if the, if the OEM is already doing this, it should be safe to use. So in some markets where customers might not be so familiar with HVO or renewable diesel, it's, uh, it's good, to, good to have that security. Mentioning some other partnerships that we have, uh, we are working with Coca-Cola, for example, in the Netherlands, where all their logistics is being operated with our Nestemai renewable diesel. Uh, so that's an interesting case uh, where they, uh, together with the different uh, fleet owners uh, and logistic companies, uh, work, work with us. Uh, other examples where we look at new technologies or new innovation is uh, one example we had with Scania, where we did a project together, uh, where we combined the data from the truck and from our filling stations to prove that a certain fuel or that the Nestemai renewable fuel went, went in uh, to the truck, that it was actually running on it. So what we did was that uh, all the trucks are connected since many years ago and our fuel stations are also connected. So we, we saw that when we had the filling event we could match the data from the two and it was then presented in the Scania fleet management portal and we enriched it with the greenhouse gas data for that fuel. So they can show to their customer not only that it was just a, a filling event, it was actually a filling event with Nestemai renewable diesel and this was the greenhouse ga gas data for it. So they could have a much more accurate uh, climate reporting and even prove that that specific truck was running on renewable fuels. So uh, I think this might be the future uh, also, but it's uh, yeah, a really interesting project. Uh, so speaking about um, more practical application uh, or uh, implementation of uh, renewable diesel, let's say, or uh, other renewable or sustainable, more sustainable alter alternatives, uh, what would you uh, suggest to consider for businesses or consumers when they plan to switch um, to these alternatives? Yeah, it's a good question because there are many different products out there and uh, different uh, alternatives. And uh, what we have done at Nest is that we have looked at the whole value chain uh, and uh, also look at the sustainability aspects from many ways, just not just the greenhouse gas emissions, but also on the working conditions, how it is produced, how it's transported and so on, and what suppliers are we working on. So I, I think for a company that wants to be sustainable, also uh, look at the, at the product you're buying and the, the whole sustainability part of it. Uh, so, uh, and, and here, the reason why we see many companies choosing Nestemai's renewable diesel is that it comes with the, the sustainability promise and they feel safe with working with us. I think also to look at the sustainability part that uh, all HVOs are not the same, so you should look at what greenhouse gas reduction you're actually getting also, because it can, it can differ. But otherwise, as we've been talking about, uh, to make the switch itself, it doesn't require much. So it's, you could continue with your infrastructure and so on and with, with your vehicles. So that is not something that you have to take special care of or anything like that. That you can already start doing today. Yes, and that, without that, huge, huge investment. Yeah, and that I think is today a big point also that uh, it's better to do something today than to wait and uh, to sort of think about it and so on. But because the climate cannot wait, we need really to act here and now. Yeah. Climate cannot wait, but also I think regulations will start pushing yeah. many companies <laughs> very yes. soon, uh, which actually leads me to the next question mm -hmm. uh, because. Um, I understand a little bit how it works for manufacturers and, uh, well, for carriers. Mm. Um, the decarbonization roadmap um, by 2050. Mm. But uh, what does it mean for fuel providers? Uh, what what does the future look like for you? Um, let's say about 2050 mm. and further. And uh, if you could maybe describe a little bit the stages. Uh, how do you have to? A report on emissions maybe or your decarbonization? Yeah, we see more and more interest to have more uh, detailed uh, reporting on how much uh, reductions you're actually getting per vehicle or per fleet and so on. 
So we are developing solutions to, uh, to transfer this uh, climate data to the clients uh, in an even more, more uh, digital way and an easier way to access it. And we also see new legislations like EU count emissions, which will require big companies to keep track of their exact emissions. So we need to be there and working together with OEMs to provide services so that these big companies can do their reporting in a, in a proper way. So that's one part of it. The other part is that we're continuing to scale up production uh, and looking for more solutions in the renewable sector and circular sector. Uh, so we are continuing to add new sustainable raw materials uh, and also new technologies. So we have five different innovation platforms at Neste where we are developing uh, new solutions and we aim at commercial operations around 2030. Uh, so that's the target at least. And we're doing pilots in all these areas. So some, one example is algae, where we look at the growing algae. Uh, we have algae farms up and running and testing out different types and see how we can produce fuel out of it. Another area is lignocellulosics, using waste from forest and agriculture in industry. And it has a huge potential in volumes. Uh, we're also looking at uh, um, yeah, waste plastic, but that's more for our renewable polymer and chemicals area where we can make renewable uh, polymer and chemicals for the plastic industry. We want to make fuel out of waste plastic. And the last area is power to X, we call it. Uh, and there we include both hydrogen, making green hydrogen, and e-fuels. So uh, we see all these as potential future areas uh, and we are working on them currently. You basically answered my question <laughs> without me asking it, yeah. because I wanted to ask about the technology you're currently working on mm -hmm. and uh, what would the future actually look like um, regarding the technology. So as I understand, mm -hmm. uh, the um, three, no, you mentioned five yeah. lines, um, but what is e-fuels? Yeah, so e-fuels, it's uh, if you have green hydrogen, and you add uh, CO2 to it, uh, you can make a, a liquid fuel, an e-fuel. So you capture carbon from the air and you add it. Uh, so uh, it, it's an, basically a fuel made from electricity, you could say, and, and uh, CO2. Uh, and you need some water also to it. <laughs> so are you saying that CO2 could be used as a fuel itself? Yeah, it, it's one component in the fuel, okay. so you have to capture <laughs> CO2 uh, and then uh, use it in, in the fuel. So it also comes with this circularity thinking that you capture CO2 uh, and you create the fuel and you burn it and you release that CO2 back. So it's also a circular solution. Okay, Matt, so since we're uh, coming to an end of this episode, uh, I would like to ask if you have any specific message that you would like to share with our listeners. Yeah, I think the message would be that there is really no silver bullet. We will need multiple solutions uh, to tackle this uh, challenge that we have ahead of us. And uh, also that uh, partnership is the key here to working together on this. And uh, the renewable diesel is something that's available here and now. So you can start making the change already today. And that really makes a difference. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for thank the you. message and for joining us today, Matt. Mm -hmm. Thanks for inviting me. I would also like to thank our listeners for joining us for today's episode. If you would like to learn more about sustainability, please visit our website and follow us on social media. I will see you next time.